Welcome to another episode of Electric City Television's Roundtable Discussions. I'm your host, Travis Prince, and today our guest is Matt Cannizzaro. Matt Cannizzaro is a 2020 grad from Marywood University. He's a painter, designer, entrepreneur, writer, and musician. He is also known as Cat Matthews in the music industry. Here's Matt Cat. Matt, how's it going? Pretty good, how are you? Pretty good, pretty good, man. I'm really happy to have you here and uh, do a more of a f- official interview with you. Um, yeah. Last December, we were at the AFA Gallery for the member show and we did a, a small interview then. So I definitely wanted to bring you back and have a more in-depth conversation about you and your art. Honored to be here. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the first thing that I want our viewers to know is a little bit about your background. Okay, sounds good to me. So, um, I went to high school, of course, and I never took an art class, ever. Throughout high school? Never. Not I loved art, though, yeah. and uh, I got in trouble a lot for drawing on tests and things, but I never took an art class. Uh, I took, like, wood shop and things like that, where, like, the, where, like, the bad kids went, yeah. and I hung out down in wood shop. Still creative, though. Very creative, but it, like, escaped. The art came out through wood shop and drafting, so then college came around, the idea of college, which I had no idea what that was. I still really don't, but I filled out some applications and they suggested I show some art and I got a scholarship to Marywood University and I've been there ever since and I just graduated graduated this year in 2020. That's awesome. Congratulations on graduating Thank too. Thank you. And um, so your time at Marywood, how, how was that? It was enjoyable. Um, I think you have to you have to make your own journey, the way you, you can get as much or as little out of it as you want. So I tried to get a lot out of it. Took three minors in uh, art history, philosophy, and uh, illustration with an art, no, with a graphic design focus, because that's a practical major, yeah. I, I suppose. But the whole time I was more interested in painting and drawing and illustrating, so talked to a lot of professors that helped me. I stayed after class. I went to their homes, they taught me what they knew, they tried to get as much as I could, and then I just pretty much focused on painting for the last two years awesome. of my journey there. Um, a philosophy course, mm. Does, mm. does that play into your art in any type of way? I think 100%. I think art reflects society, and I think philosophy is an examination of life, and especially society. So a lot of my work is me trying to put a subjective perception that I saw down so that it could be viewed objectively. I think in words that's hard to do. Uh, I think it's very different depending on who you're talking to, but I think art allows you to be a philosopher and put it down in a way where people can see it and more f- more like feel it rather than read it in uh, a way. That was actually a question that I wanted to ask you is, what role does art play in society? And you basically explain that, that One good quote I heard was, a historian tells us what happened, Mm -hmm. and the artist tells us how it felt. That's so good. That's exactly how I feel. I really like that. um, But like you say, it is to have an understanding of philosophy and being able to transfer that visually into your art so that the viewers can understand these same concepts, metaphors, ideas, I I find it important. It's, It's an important part of the job of being an artist. So true. It's one of the most important jobs out there. Um, What type of art do you identify with the most? So that's always been rough for me because, I mean, of course, I was heavily influenced by Picasso. I always loved his stuff. I liked what he did. I liked how he transcended eras and styles. Um, I guess you could say mine's like expressionistic in a way, but uh, it's definitely postmodern because I combine styles and techniques and and feelings and things that were going on at the time. So looking at society, making commentary on it has been done before. I try to do it in a way that the style is recognizable and the message is recognizable, which is postmodern in a way, but uh, definitely the expressionistic nature. I like impressionism, of course abstract. Um, I like portraiture. So combining all that together, whatever you wish to call it, I have no idea what to call it ever. I, I can really <laughs> see the different eclectic styles in your work too. And that's what really draws me to your work is, it is Picasso-esque mm-hmm. in a way, but it's so unique. And Thank you. 
uh, it's just bold and striking. And um, I really, I really, I really do enjoy your stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, is the artistic life lonely? And if you think it is, what do you do to counteract this? It's a damn good question. Uh, I definitely think it's lonely, 100%. But I take that as a as motivation and uh, inspiration for sure. Um, plenty of artists hung out, let's say, in, in lower tier lifestyles, so like brothels or bars, and they got inspiration from that. And I think that's some of the best, best work. Um, people that, that were in trenches of war and painted that. I think, I think despair, sadness, uh, the, whole, the whole idea of overcoming it with a painting is like so empowering to me. And uh, the way I put it for a lot of people is it's like a, like a hole in the ground. And the deeper you go, the better inspiration you get, mm. but it's harder to get out. To pull it back. It's hard to get out, but everyone wants to go a little deeper every time because that's where the good stuff yeah. is. So balancing that is a way that everyone has to do. You know, you, you, even if you're not an artist, you have to make sure you don't go too deep in the, into the hole. But as an artist, I feel like you don't mind it as much because you're getting something out of it that's at true. the end of the day. That painting's still there, the idea is there, that's the memory awesome. is there. So. Um, that's, the, that's another thing that I was, I've been trying to evaluate throughout this pandemic crisis that we're in right now with being um, quarantined and isolated from, you know, what we consider the norm. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I think that artists have dealt with this better just 100%. because art is kind of a, a solitary thing for the most part. And so true. The, a, a true artist with a true passion confines himself, you know, Always. for days on end to go through this creative process. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's been a little bit easier for, for people like us to handle this quarantine isolation type situation in it. And like you say, with the things that we're going, w that are going on now, you have to dig a little bit deeper mm -hmm. and get to those dark places that try to express what is going on in, in our society today. Um, what is your dream project? That, that is a tough one. Um, so I like the, that concept of a renaissance man. I really do. I don't believe that we're meant to do one thing mm. or, uh, or even 10 things. I think it's innumerable. So right now, I don't really know. Um, I like sub goals. I don't like big goals. So like a sub goal now would be to have another show mm -hmm. for art per se. I'm also a musician, so I'd like to have an album done. I have two songs done now. So there's all these little sub goals, but the whole like dream, I don't think is there yet. And I'm not, not upset about it, cause uh, that's half the fun, yeah. figuring out what it is. But smaller dreams, I don't want it to be the pinnacle of my existence, but I would like to have another show in the near future and hopefully get an album done. Those are two things I focus on a lot now. You know, that's, that's pretty good. Cause um, like you say, it's Baby steps. Baby steps. And, and life is a creative process. And like you say, you, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you may learn. You don't know what your new interests may be. Uh, and 100%. So, yeah. Uh, day by day. A major. For me, one of, my, one of my major goals is to have art on display in a prominent museum. Yeah. Um, that'd be nice. I've done tons of shows and, and galleries and stuff, but... There, in my mind at least, there's a, a slight separation between being in an art gallery and being in an art museum. Yeah. And um, like that's one of my biggest goals is to actually yeah. have some work in a museum. Yeah, well that's gonna happen. It's uh, gonna happen. What's your favorite artwork? If it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be one of your pieces. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't necessarily have to be from one of your favorite artists of all time, but uh, a piece of art that, that you are very fond of, a piece of art that, that you like. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, so, because I did minor in art history, because uh, I loved seeing all the art. Like, I just liked seeing it. I liked seeing what I could be inspired by, whether it be from 5,000 years ago, 500 years ago, or five years ago. I think there's always something you could take. If we go back, long time ago, of course the classical 
say Greek and Roman sculptures I always loved because I feel they uh, they captured uh, an emotion in a, in a moment, like almost like Medusa in a way, like turned someone to stone. Exactly. I, I appreciate that. But then I grow to enjoy someone's interpretation of a moment more. So that might have been what it literally looked like, but then someone that paints it completely different, mm -hmm. maybe abstracts a little, started enjoying that a little bit more. So like Picasso and Brock, like when they started watching films, when films came out, like their perception of a film, like I thought that was awesome because I could go through life and do that better than anyone else because no one else will know my perception. I could always try to capture an objective thing, but I might not be as good as the next guy, you know? But I, no one will ever be able to copy what I thought in my, in my mind from it. So I, I find a lot of value in that, where I could put down what I'm feeling and seeing. So I would definitely say the modernists were a big inspiration to me in how they valued that rather than just documenting, per se. Exactly. So I do like that. Um, so there, we, we have denoted several periods in history that we classify as Renaissance. Mm -hmm. The Italian Renaissance, the mm -hmm. French Renaissance, the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Do you think we are on the verge or in the near future there could be another Renaissance in, in the art world? In, in my, before you ask the question, in, in my opinion, I think this information technology digital age kind of takes away from traditional art 100%. A, little, a little bit. I agree with and that. <clears throat> and back to the question, do you think that there will be a, a renaissance or a rebirth of more traditional artists, visual artists and painters? So that would depend on society, that definitely. So like the whole rebirth thing, it's, it's never really art. It's never really society. It all reflects each other. So if I recall correctly, I believe there was a lot of money going into Italy at the time spare money per se whether it's from like a from Venice with their giant ships they were producing anything like that but they had a lot of money that's why like society was doing well not not too much conflict so they had time to value things that you wouldn't have time mm -hmm. to value if there was conflict like same with like farming people all these inventions came up because people didn't have to hunt all day there was time to like draw and do that so we have way too many issues today way too many that shouldn't be here and go on for hours why that's the case. But if they go away, there will be more time to focus on things that bring people together, like art. So if that happens, I can see appreciation of art more. Now, we're worried about things that we shouldn't be worried about. We shouldn't have to worry about, but we do. So until we catch up morally, then we're not gonna see it. But we will one day soon, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, let's see. In your artwork, what themes do you try to pursue? So a lot of, some of the portraits are just, they're just, a, like I said, a perception I capture, whether it's someone I saw or the shapes I like. So the portraits don't have too much of, say, symbolic meaning, but a lot of the other ones I do, um, I did a show called Face Reality, where it's a pun, because it's a face, um, but then it's also calling out people to examine their daily life. So I do a lot of, uh, say bar scenes, modern bar scenes. I do a lot of uh, like Instagram type images that we're all so used to, we're accustomed to, but I don't think anyone ever <clears throat> really sat back and looked at what they were. Yeah. So like the posing, the instant gratification, I touch on those themes a lot with the style. <clears throat> and I think the same as documenting a painting from the Renaissance of say people in a park or a war, I'm just documenting what I see every day. Uh, so I was happy, I, I feel like I, not the first one of course, but I felt pretty good that I painted a cell phone. Yeah. Cause I never really thought about that, like that's such a big part of our lives, you know, but you don't see it too often sometimes. But if you were looking back in history, you'd be like, oh yeah, all these people have these squares in their hands, you know? It's a big part of it, it's a huge it part of our lives, we can't even leave our house without it. So I try to, try to document that, just what I'm seeing, and like how I feel, and, and if people find it odd when you look at it in that way. So the whole face reality theme is still pretty prevalent with me. I, I like that. Um, once again, throughout the periods of the Renaissance, art and the reflection of life were somewhat romanticized. Mm -hmm. And then you had the realist movement come in where you see 
the, the Germans painting street sweepers and people cleaning and hanging out clothes or in our minor time sitting at bars mm -hmm. on their cell phones. It's the realities of life, the realities of our society and the way that we go about our, our everyday existence and documenting that is, uh, is a tremendous effort for, for the artists at hand. I've also um, had a similar concept where, like you say, if you're artists, we were people watchers. Mm -hmm. And we try to deconstruct what we're seeing. And, and this has been years in the making now where you go into a restaurant for dinner and you see a family of three, a mother, a father, and a daughter or a son, and everyone's on their cell phone. Exactly. And it's, and it's the weirdest thing. And I've, I've thought too to like, we need to capture these moments in our yeah. society and, and how society is, is shifting to this to this medium where we're together, but we're not really together. Exactly. You know, and so I, I like the fact that you hit on these themes. Those are extremely important. Um, what I want to do now is, uh, can we talk about some of your art and, and, and sure. break down some of your processes? Absolutely. Uh, so this piece that we've, we've had here this time, um, do you have a title for it? I really don't. I don't name the portraits too often. That's I just one to one to six. I do a series cool of too. six. Um, but, uh, I'm gonna tell you, for me, once again, like I said that to you the first time, your thick, bold, black outlines, it is so striking. It, to me, it shows strength and resilience in a way. <clears throat> and then to have it, have the colors inside of those dark lines, it, once again, dude, your your work really just draws me in. I, I really f feel what you're what you're trying to say. Thank you. Um, and then, like you say, just the the Picasso s type feel to it. Um, I, I really I really enjoy looking at your stuff for a piece like this. Mm -hmm. From the the con the idea and the conception mm -hmm. to the the process of actually painting on canvas into a, a complete painting. Around about how long does that take you? So this is actually the fun part. Um, it takes me longer to come up with the sketch than anything. Um, so I'll try out so many different shapes for a nose or an eye or a, a stripe pattern until I get it kind of right. And the sketch could be, uh, I just started using the iPad pretty recent, but usually just a, a notebook or something. And then once you get that, I'll use a pastel and I'll draw it quick. The same exact sketch on a canvas. And then the painting part is actually really quick because I paint really fast. Mm. I don't even wait for it to dry half the time because I'm using acrylic. Uh, so it's really fast and sporadic. But then the line work, once it's dried, will take a little longer. But I could usually get these done in maybe two, three hours. Wow. Which is, which is I, I have to kind of work fast with them because it's not like I'm precisely, it's like whatever the line looks like it is, and that's, what it, that's how it works. You know, yeah. you make it work. It, it gives it um, an organic quality to it. And, and now that you say like how fast you go with, with the insertion of the colors, mm -hmm. I can see the movement and the pace in your brush strokes that looks not rush, but more of a or organize chaos to a certain extent. Oh, for sure. And um, n like I can see how you build it now, the colors, and then come back with the lines mm -hmm. and settle it all in. Your work is phenomenal, dude. Oh, thank um, you, man. Too kind. Let's let's uh put another another piece up here and, and let's look at something else. For sure, we could do uh we'll do one of these bad boys. So this is like one of those societal comment ones I was talking about where uh, this is definitely something we've all seen before. Similar. We've seen a selfie. But the whole idea of, let's say, just covering the face with the phone, per se, it's like, why would we do that? Mm. Why? And then the whole idea of maybe like posing in a way. Are, are we living an alter ego? Is that how we normally look? Um, why do we do it? What's the motive behind it? So just me finding that interesting. You know, I think we should, you should look at the sky and find that interesting uh, if you truly understand life. So me seeing that, people would say it's just a selfie. 
you know, there's millions of them. I have thousands on my phone of myself, but like people might say, I don't usually take them. But uh, I thought it was worth capturing in a way. Uh, I thought it was worth documenting as an artist and uh, using the color palette that I use and the style, which is like a one of my three styles. So this doesn't have the precise black outline. It's more of like a looser black outline, but similar themes. Uh, I usually paint people um, very odd colors, like a yellow or, a, or an orange. Use very bright colors, uh, drastic exaggeration of features, things like that. Um, but I think the style and the message is what brings people into it, yeah. in a way. And I, I really enjoyed this piece as well, too. And, and then, like you said, the this this age that we're in, this digital age where people survive on likes exactly. from their Twitter account or their Instagram account or their Facebook account, and at the same time, like you say, you're you're taking a picture of yourself, but you're not showing yourself. Yeah. You know, you're not showing your true self. Uh, we almost live in this in this world where everyone has a facade. Yeah. Everyone wears a mask, and it's hard to see through these things sometimes to see the reality of the person, who the person truly is. Because I don't know, society seems like. <sighs> It won't allow you to be yourself, so you have to pretend to be something a little bit better so true. than you are just to keep up with everyone else. And this is a sign of our times right here. Exactly, man. It's, uh, and, and also, like you said, the, the contrast in your styles. I always admire that from artists. Um, I've been producing art for a long time, and in the recent years, I've, I feel my art is a little stale for the simple fact that I'm a little bit fearful of changing my style up, and I wish I, I had, you know, more courage to uh, s switch it up a little bit, make it a little bit looser or a little bit tighter or alter the colors that I normally use on my palette, and you have no problem at all just doing what you, you feel on the canvas, and this is a, a great example of um, being able to switch styles and switch techniques and still be able to produce a, a valuable image. Um, Thank you. You are too kind. Yeah, I, I really appreciate your stuff, dude. Let's uh, show some more. Absolutely. So we got a, another large portrait here. The same style, just to show you how the series is uh, is coming. This is a new series I did. I had an original series of six that was uh, relatively large. This is like a medium size. Uh, I have smaller ones, but. Um, these are definitely different from my original ones. I feel like they evolved a little, where I use a lot more buildup of shape, usually square, rectangle, um, like in here and mm -hmm. here. And then uh, a lot bolder black lines, a little thicker on the black lines. And more, more or less, like if you look at it a little too much, it almost doesn't look like a, a person anymore. The par parts are just, it's made up of shape per se, like this and this, where it's not so much it's losing its its human likeness a little. So I definitely like these. I like the, the color palette as well. I'm trying to go, uh, like I said, very quick, very fast, and then the fine line work later. Mm. When, once you, now you said that your, your conception and your sketches take a lot longer mm -hmm. to contrive than the actual piece itself. What, motivates you to use certain shapes on a certain piece? So that could be, and that's the fun part also, uh, it could be like a car or something or a, a bird I see that I like jotted down and then that shape, it's like why did I draw that? Mm -hmm. It's like it might make sense for a painting. So it's just kind of putting all those together until you kind of get something you like. For example, like this stupid thing could have been you know, like a, like a grate or something I saw that I sketched, and then that shape became part of this, and then mm. this could have been something. And I draw eyeballs a lot. All my eyeballs are usually different, like one's always different than the other. So I have, to, I have books of eyeballs wow. and ears. And you just kind of, so you could, I do like a hundred of these, and you get like one good one, you yeah. know, in my, in my mind. I'm like, all right, this one. And then I don't wait. 
I'll just paint it quick because if I think about it, I'll say, oh, that's not good enough. But kind of when you feel it, you just you just make it. Yes, go just ahead make and get it. it out there. Could be 3 a.m. I don't care what time it is. I was like, I got to do that one. Now you say this is for you. This is a somewhat of a medium-sized canvas. Yeah. So what's what's some of the largest formats you've worked on? So the largest I had, uh, probably like four by three, like four foot by three, mm -hmm. is my largest. And in that, and honestly, I'm nothing <coughs> like special. If anybody thinks that like you have to have money or anything to be an artist. These are like AC Moore campuses, by the way. Like these aren't anything crazy. So I would just wait till they went on sale and I would go by those sizes. So I am a little confined at this point by sizes that exist. Um, so I don't, cause I didn't stretch my own yet. You mm -hmm. know, I'm doing, I don't do it often. So th I think that's the biggest they have at AC Moore. Otherwise yeah. I would have gone larger than the four by three. But, I'm, uh, in, I'm in the same boat with you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A lot of my canvases are yeah. standard size and someone asks like, why don't you stretch your own canvases? And then it's a tedious process. It's like, yeah. But uh, I, that's one of the next things I want to get into is stretching mm -hmm. for two main reasons for me is you can create whatever size canvas you want to work on. Mm -hmm. And the second part is I think it makes the piece even more of your own. Yeah. Because you built the frame, you stretched the canvas, you came up with the concept and you applied it to the canvas. So it, it, it rounds off the project as, as yours in itself. Even in that first step of creating the material, um, creating the surface, you're going to actually apply your paint to. Very yeah. true. Then, yeah. a, then a part of me is like, hey, the old masters used to paint on like wood and, and, and like walls. It's yeah. like it doesn't devalue it. Doesn't, it doesn't you know? matter. It's the Mona Lisa is painted on a piece of wood. Yeah, it's, it's like, like, come on. So whatever I give you, you, you better like it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the the image, the imagery itself is, is what's important. And the message in the imagery is not what it's painted on. Exactly. exactly. I, I love I love this this pink. Yeah. This uh, fuchsia kind of goes up into a little magenta over here. Man, your colors are bold, bold, bold. I'm, I'm, I'm really loving it. Thank you so much. Yeah. There's a lot of like abuse going on with this too. I beat the canvas with like sponges and towels. I can see that. Here. And it, and you gotta actually hit it pretty yeah. hard, you know, to, to get it. Like when you feel it, it's like you couldn't duplicate. Like say that line it has to be just quick. Yeah. And. Uh, and that's definitely part of the fun for me too. I, I don't like being confined, which is kind of contradictory because the line's confined, but that's after. Afterwards. So like, it's never like, oh, I have to make sure that's green right there. No, it's just if it is, it is, you know, wherever the line work goes. So that's definitely the, it reflects me too, where it's like there's some order going on, but it's mostly chaos, chaos. you know? <laughs> it's, yeah, confined chaos. Confined don't chaos. Don't break the boundaries. <laughs> Exactly. You have any more to show us? Yeah, I got another big one, and then we got some smaller ones. So this is uh, the third one of the series. I got six. And this one has, like, the most line work, I would say, um, out of the newer series. And it, it gets kind of crazy, and you get a little dizzy if you look at it. But, yeah. but I do like some of the new things that came from it, so... Uh, the hair, how I handle hair, that's new to me, and I definitely use that on more pieces now. So on the side there with those triangles of different color, and then up top, that's definitely new. And then extending these rectangular paths that much is new to me as well. Uh, so I start using them a lot more, like this flowing into here, having it there, having it there. Um, on the on the male figures, if if they're human or not, I use the stubble a lot, so I like See, that. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Um, like I said, always two different eyes. Uh, this one was kind of cool because most of his forehead was an eyebrow. Certain things like that. I always try to relatively use complementary colors, but sometimes I stray away from that. But definitely like how it sticks out. Yeah, um, the, the patterns in here really immediately caught me and like you said it's, it's it's this portion the rat tangles that come down it immediately catches your eye and forces you to flow around the image itself and the mouth is just like <laughs> so striking yeah the red so I only use the red in a couple spots yeah little things like that and I really only do use maybe like five six colors usually on, on each do you, piece. Do you purposely limit your color palette? Mm -hmm. I think if you use too much, it, it doesn't look 
kind of like let's say canon with my other portraits because they're always usually just the, the first series was strict complimentary just mm. red and green and, and all that and uh, then I strayed away a little but I still want to make sure I only use like five or six so like the red is used throughout but you really only see it here and there mm. so I think that's why it works if it wasn't there it, would, it would, wouldn't look quite as good in my opinion and that's that's a, a difficult process to purposefully limit yourself to the colors you have on your palette and still be able to produce what you see in your head. Um, somebody tasked me to that challenge and I couldn't do it. I showed somebody my palette one time and I had 15 colors on there. It was like, you got too many colors. I'm like, I need all of them. I need those. <laughs> I need those colors though. <laughs> but uh, being able to, like you say, use your, the base colors and, and use complementary colors to produce a piece is, uh, is extraordinary. Just to limit yourself that much and still be able to do this. Uh, Thank you. Even the beard stuff has got the chest hairs and, <laughs> and everything. Exactly. Something almost reminiscent of a tribal tattoo. Right, exactly. Like even th that ear was a, a cool ear to do because that was definitely a sketch, mm -hmm. I remember. And it's like, what the hell is that? Is that an ear? But it is now. The Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> yeah, recognizable elements. But it's all built with shape, though. It's all just shapes that come together. Yeah. Really, really interesting, dude. Really interesting Thank stuff. Thank you. Let's really show them some more. Yeah, I just got these two little ones for okay. now. Okay, oh, we'll keep this up here. Sure. And so th this is actually, I sold a couple of these guys. I made a bunch of them. Uh, it's called the Titterer. It means one who laughs nervously. Um, I brought in a bunch of paintings for my first show I did at Marywood, and this was there, and I wasn't going to show it, because I was like, what the hell even is it? But my one teacher really liked it, so he's like, you got to show that. And I did, and someone wanted it and bought it, so I started making a bunch of them. So it's kind of my go-to piece, my small little dude I make. I don't even know what it's doing, but it's a weird face. But then I made this one in celebration of the COVID season. Uh, and it, and it speaks volume. As odd as that design is, it speaks volume. Because we, we could be like this. We could be laughing nervously, but we wouldn't know. Wouldn't even know. Because that's, that's the world we're in right now. So this guy might look normal, but he's, he's making that face, face under that mask, you know, so. I'm pretty worried. It's kind of it's kind of symbolic. Maybe we wear a mask all the time. Back to know? the facade. Right? And mm -hmm. uh, now we're actually wearing them. And uh, it makes everything more clear in a way, which is ironic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a very rare titterer here, uh, 2020 titterer. So, uh, how many of these have you produced over the years? Uh, I just started making them last year, and I think I made like six of them, uh, all of the pretty much the same size. I sold three of them, um, but they're all pretty much the same. I differ sometimes with the colors, but uh, usually this is the main one. Um, how long did it take you to come up with this character? This was a super odd sketch I did during class. I remember in, in like, a, I think it was my Italian class in the notebook, and I was like, that is awesome. So I went home, and I remember it was a really quick painting, like real fast I did it, like just splattered, and then didn't use the fine line work. So this is more like that other one I showed you with the cell phone mm -hmm. style, the loose black line work. We really don't care, messy. And, uh, and the titter was born, and then... Uh, then I kept making more of them. They get a little better every time, I think. They're all a little different, which is cool. Yeah. But um, I definitely wanted to try to express the whole COVID-19 pandemic, and I definitely thought, what better than the titterer, you know? Once again, trying to implement the, the signs of our times and put it into art. Exactly. And, and document it. That's and all we can do. So what do you what do you have on your on your tablet? Yeah, I would just uh, just want to show some process on here. So I never had an iPad until this year, so it's all new to me. Um, but it was really good for these preliminaries, um, which helped me out a lot. So I could show you. And uh, I don't know. Do you have an iPad? Do you use it? I don't, but I actually want to get one. Uh, normally, when I I work from photographs, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that printing. Continuously printing photographs is a little bit more expensive. I, I think I might invest in a, a iPad just to have my images digitally. Highly recommend it. Because yeah. I, I was so against it. I was like, I'm not paying that. But, but I got one. I was like, whatever. And it's like painting with magic. If yeah. you gave this to Michelangelo, 
he would think you were a wizard because yeah. you have every brush and everything. So this, I'm just going to go through this kind of live here. These are all layers. And this is actually going to be that first painting I had up. So I'm just going to turn these layers back on. And this is kind of just what I did. And it's what I would do with a brush. But I'm doing it on here. So th this is what you got. And then I went back and I added all this line work. And then that's pretty much that wow, painting. Dude. And that's just me doing that. And it's the most in-depth preliminary I've ever done. Because usually a sketchbook, you just have the line work. I never got to work out the colors before. Mm -hmm. But on here, I really got to work everything out. And it's not exact, because you you let the feeling take you away with the paintbrush. But it's pretty close, pretty close. So I could do that with any painting. And uh, I didn't waste any paper. I didn't waste any materials. So that's why I like the iPad. Wow. It's really cool. So I did a lot of my stuff on here as of recent. The new series, I pretty much did all on here first, worked out all the colors. And there's so many variations of this that didn't have those colors. Um, but eventually you get it, and then you can just make it happen. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how why. Long, how long did it take you to get proficient with that program? This is Procreate. Uh, it was like 10 bucks, I think, one-time payment. And it took me a little bit. It's kind of tricky. A Big transition curve. with yeah. this thing, this Apple Pencil. It's really cool. Um, but maybe a month. Or two. Once you figure out how the brushes work, and, and it's touch sensitive, so you push a little harder, thicker, Deeper, yeah. and uh, and then I just kind of went with it. And instead of watching TV or whatever, I would just sketch on here and think of new paintings to make. That's awesome. So it's definitely worthwhile um, to pick one up. It's like infinite art supplies in your bag, which is which is fun. But that's the that's the one thing too I say about us visual artists is. <sighs> Use the technology, but don't lose exactly. the original foundations. And once again, even if you gave Michelangelo a camera, imagine what he could have did with that. True. You know? Would it be the same, though? E exactly. That's the thing. And I don't want to, like, some people, they do this and they never let it go. They're like, I'm digital Just forever. Just to print that out and yeah. put that on the canvas. And it's like, but it's not the same to me, man. Like, people are like, oh, you got them right there. I'm like, no, I have to paint all these now. These are just preliminaries. Yeah. Um, but I mean, digital has its place, you know, it has its place. I definitely think it's awesome, but the physical object and, and the feeling of the actual brush strokes is, is what I like. You can't, I don't you can't think recreate that. No, you no can't. No way. So I use it still. I, I make it very clear that it's just preliminaries on there. It's just a tool. I'm just a tool. It's like, it's a notebook for me, except yeah. I don't have to spend more money on it, you know? <laughs> Well, Matt, I really appreciate you coming into the studio and, and talking with us and sharing your fantastic art with us, dude. I'm so honored that you had me. You know? It's my pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'm your host, Travis Prince. This has been another episode of ECTV's Roundtable Discussions. Our guest for today was Matt Cat. Really appreciate you guys watching the show, and we'll see you next time.